We have uh, seen how there has been a loss of a biblical worldview. We have seen how the biblical worldview gave way to deism of the French Revolution and atheistic materialism of the modern world under the influence of uh, Darwinian science. What has the church done through all this? And we see that the church did not defend the biblical worldview. This worldview is a powerful worldview because it comports with reality. It is comprehensive. It addresses all areas of life. But the church acted like ostriches at the time that the secular worldview swept into universities and into schools of theology. Instead of defending the biblical worldview, the leadership of the church 120 years ago acted like ostriches. The ostrich is a big bird. It can't fly, but it, it can run fairly fast. It's pretty powerful. But it's very dumb. And the ostrich grazes on the plains of Africa, and the, the urban legend has it that when a lion comes, the ostrich will run away from the lion until it finds a hole in the ground. And when it finds a hole in the ground, the ostrich will stick its head in the hole. And something miraculous happens when the ostrich does that, the lion disappears. And the ostrich thinks for one brief moment that he's really quite smart. But the next thing that happens is that the ostrich is dead and the lion has lunch. And this is what the leadership of the church did about 120 years ago. Instead of defending the biblical worldview, the leadership of the church stuck its head in the sand. And they responded to this onslaught of secular materialism or atheism in two ways. First, there was a group that accommodated this new worldview. They have become known as the liberals. Many in the old line denominations hold this worldview. And they essentially have brought a naturalistic worldview to uh, the life of the church. I grew up in a, a Methodist church where the pastor had accommodated this uh, secular worldview. And I remember a sermon that he preached one time. It was on miracles. And he said, we know that there really cannot be miracles. And of course, from a naturalistic worldview, there's no such thing as a miracle. And he went on to explain the miracles in a naturalistic way. And he said, how did Jesus walk on water? Or how did Peter walk on water? He knew where the stones were. How did Jesus feed 5,000? Everybody had their own sack lunch and no one was willing to share until the little boy was willing to share his lunch and then everybody else got their lunches out and there was more than enough food for everybody. And the, this pastor went on to say there was no making of loaves and fishes. No, the miracle was that people shared their lunch with one another. So everything had to be explained in a naturalistic way. What is the Bible? What is the church? What does it mean to be a Christian? What is the role of the church in the world? All of these were explained in a naturalistic way. And then there was another group. These reacted to this secular worldview 
And they very proudly took on the identity of fundamentalists. They wanted to maintain their belief in the fundamentals of the scripture. And these, I think, are the forefathers of, of most of us. These are the forefathers of the evangelical, the Pentecostal, and the charismatics. But these did not maintain the biblical worldview. They were afraid of Darwinian science. They were afraid of questions. They were afraid of reason. They wanted to stick to the fundamentals, but how do we do that with this onslaught of new ideas? And what they did was adopt the Greek dichotomy, the Greek dualistic mentality, the sacred-secular divide. The Greeks divided the universe into two parts, the spiritual and the physical. And the spiritual was sacred and the physical was secular. They separated grace from nature. And when you looked at all the different categories of life, like we talked about earlier, science and art and music and theology and ethics, they, they took and they divided these. Which are the spiritual ones? Which are the secular ones? And so they created the sacred secular divide. They cut Sunday off from Monday. Only things that are spiritual are important. This is how we might view this new worldview. I call it evangelical Gnosticism. God is interested in the sacred, but he's not interested in the secular. He's interested in evangelism and missions and church planting. He's interested in the devotional life, but he's not interested in athletics. He's not interested in business and economics. He's not interested in politics. He's not interested in art. These are all worldly subjects, and, and godly Christians will stay far away from these things. So now you have this ancient Greek mindset that's come into the church through seminaries, through Bible schools. The seminaries graduated pastors with a dualistic framework. And the Bible schools graduated missionaries. And the pastors went out and pastored churches and the missionaries went to Africa, to Asia, to Central and South America. And they brought with them a very narrow gospel, a gospel shaped by this Gnostic paradigm. They brought with them the Greek commission where our task is simply to save souls for heaven and to plant churches. So everything began to change about the church. What does it mean to be a Christian? What is the Bible? What is the nature of the church? What is the role of the church in society? What is the mission of the church? All of these things began to be defined by this Greek sacred-secular worldview. And we have lost too many things. I'll mention three at this moment. One, we've lost the Christian mind. We no longer think like Christians. Reason is suspect. Questions are suspect. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a pastor or a church leader say, don't ask questions, just believe. And quite frankly, the church, the larger church today is virtually incapable of challenging the bastion, the intellectual bastions of, of secularism. Because we no longer 
know how to think. And particularly, we, do not no, long, we no longer know how to think as Christians. We have our spiritual life here, our university, our education here. This is why somebody can go to the university, study Darwinism, and come out believing in the Darwinian model, and at the same time going to church on Sunday because their life is divided. We have lost the Christian mind. The second thing that we have lost is the Great Commission. The Great Commission is nothing less than to disciple nations. And we have reduced the Great Commission to saving souls for heaven. You can ask a pastor, what is the Great Commission? And they'll say, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and save souls for heaven. Then you ask them to read the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and, then, and you say, now what is the Great Commission? And they'll say, go into all the world, preach the gospel, save souls for heaven, and plant churches. This paradigm, this Gnostic paradigm is so powerful we cannot even see the words that are printed on the paper. And we've reduced the Great Commission to this Greek Commission. The third thing that we have lost is the Samaritan strategy. We see in the story of the Good Samaritan, a lawyer had asked Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And the lawyer, um, Jesus said, well, what does it say in the scripture? And the lawyer says, well, to love God and to love your neighbor. And Jesus said to the lawyer, go and do this. And the lawyer, seeking to justify himself, said, but who is my neighbor? And then Jesus went on to tell the story of the Samaritan. And Jesus, it's interesting, changed the, the uh, parsing of the word from a noun to a verb. It went from who is my neighbor to who neighbored. Who acted neighborly? And we've lost that because taking care of people's physical needs, dealing with issues of hunger and justice, these are all worldly activities to be left to the government. Now Jesus wants to reach the world where the world is bleeding. And this is the significance of the story of the Good Samaritan. And he says to the lawyer at the end, go and do likewise. We have lost the Christian mind, the Great Commission, and God's strategy, the Samaritan strategy. We've given up too much in giving up the biblical worldview. I'd like to uh, leave you with a question. What are the consequences of this evangelical Gnosticism, this sacred, secular divide in your life and in the church. How do you see this dualism affecting your church and your life?